Uh, hello, everyone. Welcome. I am Jet Aguilar from the Astronomical League of the Philippines. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, this will be our, and I will be your host, and this will be our 10th webinar actually in this uh, in our in this year's 2022 astronomy expert speaker series and uh, wow in about a week it will be christmas already and we have a very timely topic uh, today which is about the star of bethlehem and i remember since my childhood i have wondered about the star of bethlehem uh, this was the celestial phenomenon that guided the three wise men to the birthplace of the infant jesus christ was it a miracle, a fable, or scientific reality? Jesuit professional astronomer, Father Chris Corbali, will try to shed some light on this gospel mystery from the perspective of modern astronomy, as well as from exploring ancient wisdom. My fellow ALP member, Ms. Imelda Joson, will be doing the introductions. For those who are not able to register but will still want to watch this webinar, we are currently live streaming on Facebook at the Facebook page of Philippine Astronomy Forum. So you can uh, visit the Philippine Astronomy Forum Facebook page if you want to watch live streaming. Before we start, kindly allow me to explain some rules for this webinar to help us make this an enjoyable learning experience for everyone. Please listen and do your best to give your undivided attention to our speaker. There will be a short question and answer session at the end of the lecture. You may type in your questions under the Q&A tab found in your Zoom interface at any point during the presentation. We will do our best to read and answer your questions live after the lecture or via the Q&A tab. We would like to remind everyone that the contents presented in this webinar will remain as the individual property of the lecturer and the photographers in the presentation. We will also be distributing certificates of attendance via email to all registered attendees who will be present with us throughout the webinar today. So please use the name you have written in your registration forms to help us facilitate this process. So enjoy the webinar and let us all have fun learning. And uh, this is uh, the flow of our webinar today. And I would like to turn you over now to Ms. Imelda Joson to give the introductions for our speaker. Thanks, Jet. Uh, before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to thank all of you for joining us and to all our friends at the ALP for their hard work in hosting this Astronomy Expert Speaker Series. I'd like to thank our dear friend, Father Chris Corbley, and all our past speakers for their generosity in sharing with all of us their time and expertise. It was back in the late 80s when we were introduced to Father Corbelli by one of our mentors in astronomy, Father Francis Hayden. Although it took over a decade before we actually met Father Chris in person when he invited us to speak at the 1999 Vatican Observatory summer school held at the Specula Vaticana in Castel Gandolfo. Our friendship with him has grown over the time, over the years, that he has become not just a friend, but a mentor and a confidant. He's one of the most down-to-earth persons that Edwin and I have met, considering all his accomplishments. Father Chris entered the Society of Jesus in 1963, completed his licentiate in philosophy at Haythrop College, Oxfordshire in 1968. Earned his bachelor's degree in physics from Bristol University in 1971, a master's degree in astronomy from the University of Sussex, Brighton in 1972 earned his B.D. in Theology from Haythrop College, London in 1976, and was ordained in the Society of Jesus on the same year. He earned his Ph.D. in Astronomy from the University of Toronto in 1983, and has served several terms as Dean of the Vatican Observatory Summer School. 
He is an astronomer at the Vatican Observatory Research Group, having previously served as its vice director until 2012. He was the president of the International Astronomical Union's Division 4 from 2009 to 2012. He is the current president of the National Committee for Astronomy in the Vatican City State for the IAU. He's an adjunct associate astronomer at the University of Arizona's Department of Astronomy. Father Chris is a member of the Royal Astronomical Society, as well as the American Astronomical Society. He's a member of the Institute on Religion in an Age of Science, for, he, for which he was president from 1999 to 2002. He is a co-author of several scientific papers, as well as four books on astronomy. For his many accomplishments in the field of astronomy, particularly his contributions in areas of multiple stellar systems, stellar spectral classifications, galactic structure, star formation, and telescope technology, the International Astronomical Union named as in 2020 named asteroid 119248 Corbally. Friends, I believe no other person can enlighten us better on the star of Bethlehem than Father Chris, who has devoted his life studying stars and theology. Let us welcome Father Chris Corbally. Well, sounds if we're on. Is that right? Yes, Father. Uh, Thank you. Yeah. Thank you indeed. So thank you, Imelda, for that wonderful welcome. And uh, along with Edwin, your husband, it's been wonderful knowing you over all these years. So we had a little glitch to start off with, and that's why I've got a rather mysterious lighting, because I'm not using a computer in the usual place. But these glitches, I think, are sent to try us. There seems to be a kind of a force, maybe an evil force, that doesn't quite want us to uh, uh, investigate the heavens and find out the truth. But it's now, it's wonderful to be with you. And so let me start by uh, sharing a screen and looking at our uh, PowerPoint slides. So uh, there'll be a lot of technical details in what was the star of Bethlehem, but I think what uh, hopefully what we do find is that um, the uh, uh, you know don't worry too much about the technical details, uh, but let the general drift of it sort of uh, go with you. So I think that's the important thing. Okay, and I'll pop that up. Okay, so. What indeed was the star of Bethlehem? Hmm. There's obviously been a lot of debate over many years about this. Um, and as Imelda said at the beginning, what we're trying to decide in our own minds is the three possibilities, it would seem. Um, was it miraculous? And could well be. Was it, you know, just a kind of imagination? the wonderful theological imagination of Matthew in the gospel, or was it based on some kind of reality? Okay, let's see and explore. What you have here now are two versions of Matthew chapter two at the beginning, King James version on the left and the new revised standard version on the right. This is the account um, in the time, of, well, I'm reading the right end, <laughs> in the time of King Herod, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea, wise men from the east came to Jerusalem. Ah, so now the important bits in this, the concern, what, what brought them to Jerusalem and seeking the child was this, where is the child who has been born king of the Jews, for we observed his star in the RSV on the right at its rising and have come to pay him homage. The other, the more traditional King James version says, we've seen his star in the east, and that may be traditional for you. Hmm. So at its rising or in the east was this star. In the east was the wrong direction, 
for the wise men who actually came from east of Judea. So, but then the next bit, then Herodly secret court, secretly called for the wise men and learned from them the exact time when the star had appeared. Oh, so there's a, a timing involved in that too. And then he, Herod sent them off to Bethlehem, having uh, discovered that it was Bethlehem in Judah from the um, Herod's uh, advisors where the, the new king would be born. And then when they set off, when they had heard the king, this is the wise men, they set out and ahead of them went the star that they had seen at its rising until it stopped over the place where the child was. Hmm. Uh, the other thing is it, uh, in the King James, when it, till he came and stood over where the young child was. So um, what on earth could this mean in, uh, in astronomy? What might it be? But let's turn first to Pope Benedict, um, who wrote this uh, book on the infancy narratives, Jesus of Nazareth. What kind of star was it? Was there a star at all? And he writes the question whether or not this was an astronomically identifiable and classifiable celestial apparition was not going to go away. It would be wrong to dismiss it a priori, so right off out of hand, on account of the theological character of the story. Hmm. So with the emergence of modern astronomy, the question of this star has been revisited. And that's what we're going to look at, the revisiting. As I said, this has been a question over many ages. OK, now I'm going to switch screens. And because this is, um, uh, and look at this. So what was the star of Bethlehem? Yes, OK. Was it a legend or a miracle or a real event? Let's go and see. This again, what we've been thinking about. From the Gospel of Matthew, it must have been a newly appeared object since it drew the wise men from the east. And you can see that the bottom here is uh, John Mosley, who is director of the Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles for a good while. And this is his story, The Christmas Star. So the star appeared twice. Hmm. First, it led the Magi to Jerusalem for an audience with Herod. Later, it stood over, or oh, whatever, Bethlehem. Matthew does not mention that the star was especially bright. And we can assume that Herod and his advisors didn't see it since he asked the wise men when it had appeared. So the star is referred as a single object, a star, not a bunch of stars. So, hmm. okay, let's do some... What was the exact year Christ was born? We'll revisit this again, um, but it's sometime between, um, this is uh, the years BC, between 8 BC and 1 BC. Okay. Um, and John Mosley is taking a, a date sometime around 3 BC. We'll revisit this. But um, what we want to now look at the astronomy. Now, was it a comet? Ooh, those are lovely things that appear with a room with big tails in the sky if it's the bright one. But comets, John Mosley says, can be ruled out since they were generally thought to be evil omens. Mm -hmm. We'll revisit that. Meteors are even less likely since they are such short-lived phenomena. They just streak across the sky, shooting stars. Mm. Probably not. Supernova, these are when uh, a massive star explodes and can be as bright as its parent galaxy. It's so bright. There are possibility, but there are problems as well. There are no certain observations of supernova during the time period. And one could assume that a supernova bright enough to be seen by the Magi would have been noticed by other observers as well. Now, the Chinese kept wonderful um, records of what they call guest stars, uh, among which were supernova, uh, which appeared and then went away. So mm, maybe not supernova. So what? The Magi were Babylonian astrologers. Astrology. Now notice this is the the science is astronomy, and there's no good reasons for having the two names. Um, but astrology is, you know, what you find in the back of your newspaper, or if you have newspapers nowadays, it's that, uh, you know, the stars, your star, what sign you were born under. Astrology places particularly importance on the motion position of the planets, okay? 
And if we look at the night sky during the period of 3 to 2 BC, we can find a very likely candidate for the star of Bethlehem. Okay, so look, uh, what you want to see is this window down bottom left, uh, sorry, bottom right, as our view from the Earth, and these are the planets going around the sun, that's our Earth, and you can see vision. Now watch carefully that box, oh, two come together. Okay, and we could actually do it again. Two planets from our vision from the Earth come together, and that's called a conjunction. So they look together, although they are miles apart you know, in our solar system. So that's conjunction joining together. Okay. Now, planetary conjunctions are a fairly common happening. There were nine major conjunctions in the period of time from 3 to 2 BC. But on August the 12th, the 3 BC, there occurred a conjunction of Venus and Jupiter, which would have had particular significance to astrologers. Okay, not astronomers, that's current science, who had knowledge of the prophecy of the birth of Jesus or a, a, a king. Um, okay, so something occurred, a conjunction. Oh, there we go. Jupiter and Venus in the constellation of Leo and the brightest star in Leo is this one regular star at the bottom there. Let's see it again. Jupiter coming along and Venus catches up and they join together. That's the conjunction. Mm. Now, Jupiter is king. Venus is the female figure um, and femininity. Regulus, well, that's also its name, very name means a ruler. Leo, uh, for the astrologers, because be the tribal sign of Judah. So these uh, good Babylonians, um, knowing their astrology and their law, would say, oh, something's going to happen in Judah, um, and it's going to concern a king being born, you know, the, um, the female figure, Venus. Oh, okay, this is wonderful. But perhaps more interesting, watch that star. Oh, oh my goodness. Did you see it? The Jupiter came along and they seem to stop in Leo, go back and then go, go forward again, move past it. A second time, so look at the date, September the first, 14th um, was the first date. And then had to wait till February in as the year turned for the, the next happening. Let's watch it again. Okay, goes back, it stops, go back, for regulus and on again. Oh, what on earth is happening? How can that happen in the sky? Well, it happens like this. Again, this box bottom right as seen from earth and as seen, watch you, oh, the thing does go backwards. It's because it's further out and away, Jupiter's further away from us than the sun. And because we are moving around the sun faster, well, in the shorter time than Jupiter takes to go around the sun. And so we can see that um, going backwards or retrograde motion as it seems. Now that's great fun. And you can notice it yourself, particularly on say Mars or even Jupiter if you wait. Okay, so that's uh, astronomy. That's, oh, as it says, um, John Mercy says, the same effect can be seen when you pass a slow moving car on the, the highway. The car appears to move backwards against the background, even though you're both moving forward, and then finally it sort of continues to, to go. So, okay. Now, finally, on June the 17th of uh, 2 BC, Jupiter and Venus came again into conjunction near Regulus so close as to appear as one shining light until they set in the west towards Jerusalem as seen from Babylon. Okay, Jupiter and Venus, these important things, let's watch them again. There's Jupiter slowly going along and there's Venus and together they appear so close that they seem one huge bright star. So these are the two brightest, well, brightest objects in our sky, these, these planets. So that would really Okay, uh, I've got some uh, wise men in their comfortable chairs in Babylon, uh, off those chairs and onto stinking camels for a long months long journey to uh, Judah or Jerusalem, uh, uh, eventually to inquire. Would it? Uh, maybe it wouldn't have got you off your chair, but it would, could easily have got an astrologer of those times off their chairs. 
Okay, so where are we then? Hmm. Yeah, if it was a real astronomical, what could it have been then this conjunction? Our first thing really is that we need to look at other views and particularly these ones here are contemporary views. David Hughes, they've all written books. You get astronomers who all get a great idea of what the star would be and they write these books and none of them agree. Isn't that fun? So it's now up to us to decide what we're going to pick. Um, David Hughes, Michael Molnar, Mark uh, Kidger there, and then Gustav Terra's SJ. So he, for a time, was a member of our Vatican Observatory, and he was interested in the Bible and astronomy and had a, a theory there as well, as we'll see. Okay, but the first thing to establish is when was Jesus born? Now, okay, um, John, mostly in that presentation uh, you know, of his that I showed you, those animations, I uh, figured it was around, you know, two to three BC, which would be put it around here. But Herod had died by then. This line marks when Herod was king. So it's got to be before 4 BC. So with respect to um, John Mosley, no, probably not. And this bottom then is the best estimate uh, of, uh, at least in my, Michael Molnar, of uh, the, the birth of Jesus, somewhere between uh, 8 and 4 BC is the most likely period. So you've got these various things, slaughter of the innocents. So uh, that's got to be before Herod dies, and then Sat uh, Saturninus, legate of Syria, um, John the Baptist. Jesus is born in six months after John the Baptist, etc. But you can read it all for yourself. Um, so let's go with then 8 to 4 BC is the most probable time. But planetary conjunctions is, uh, occur fairly regularly. So which one was it? That it was one, uh, at least seems to be in this bas relief from the third century. So this is in stone. Um, and uh, in the, the figures are kind of come out from the stone. And we have this Mary, Joseph behind, child Jesus, the three wise men, and pointing to a lovely planetary conjunction up there. So there was a big, strong tradition in the third century after uh, Jesus was born um, of a planetary conjunction. <sighs> but there's a whole bunch of them. Notice at the bottom right, this is after David Hughes, so the various authors will come down there. And again, you can look up the details, but there was a wonderful triple conjunction. So three times the planets came together, Saturn and Jupiter, uh, in 7 BC. Um, first conjunction um, in May, the second one in September, and then there's this stationary point where they stand in, in November. So did May get them off their seats and onto camels? The acronym rising, that's when uh, stars arise at, um, as the sun sets so that uh, um, those stars or planet in this case rises up in the east. And the rising is obviously to do with birth. So was that the birth of Jesus in September of 7 BC. Um, so, and was this uh, then the second station, stationary point? Oh, stood over, um, you know, Bethlehem. Oh, is that what it that what it's all about? And maybe the, this language we have to kind of translate Matthew into uh, uh, astrological language, as it were. But it's also another phenomena at that time. After the sun sets, if you're in a really dark sky and there's no moon, you get this amazing kind of line, uh, light coming up from, from the west. And it's actually the sun reflecting off the dust particles in our um, solar system. And Oh, it's, it's beautiful, but you have to have a dark sky and no moon. And um, Ferrari, Giuseppe, and uh, Gust 
Father Gustav Teres were thinking, well, yeah, look, these, um, there's nice alignment of these two planets up here, very close together, um, 7, 12th of November, 7 BC. And the zodiacal light was pointing, yeah, maybe down to towards Bethlehem. So maybe that's the kind of the stood over and pointing down to Bethlehem from Jerusalem. Hmm, could have been that. Okay, so that's them. How about Michael Molnar? Now he is a wonderful collector and he is a wonderful collector of co ancient coins. And so he is now going for this particular one. Uh, this coin was issued by the governor of Syria, um, Quintus Silenus in AD 13 to 14. So rather after the time, but not too long after. And this, it really seems to commemorate this um, occultation, the moon, that's the moon passing in front of um, an object. So in this case, it's Jupiter, the bright star, the king star, and it passes by, um, over, across Jupiter for a moment, then it, uh, after a while, Jupiter reappears again. Uh, it passes by in a significant constellation, Aries, the ram, and for at this time, well, maybe it was the ram rather than Leo that represented Judea. So th that's the idea of this um, and uh, Michael Molnar's case. It's a kind of amassing of the stars, uh, sun, and the, the planets together in, this is uh, the sign with the horns there for the constellation Aries. Yeah, and then for on sunrise for April the 17th on 6 BC, there's a whole bunch of things with the sun about to rise all in the east. And oh, this would really shake the, you know, the, the these magi, these wise men off out of their seats and onto a horse, I'm um, sorry, onto camels. Um, this is what it might look like in the sky. But the only problem is that Jupiter getting real close uh, to the sun couldn't be seen because the sun is so bright and they wouldn't have been able to predict it. Um, they didn't, their calculations weren't good enough. They were good, but not good enough to predict this. So, okay, with respect to Michael Molnar, um, maybe not. So let's see what Mark Kidger has got an idea about. The may, uh, there's an amazing sequence he pointed out of, well, First, the triple conjunction of summer and fall in 7 BC. We saw that amazing coming together of uh, Jupiter and uh, whatever it is, Saturn together. That was uh, amazing. Okay, one thing to get them thinking about things. Then there's the massing of the planets in Aries in the spring of 6 BC, which we've just seen. So that would get them really thinking. Um, but, you know, it took a bit to get them off the, the seats and onto the camels. Then we have a pairing in Pisces, like another constellation uh, in February 5 BC, Moon and Jupiter paired, and those are two significant, Jupiter the king, Mars and Saturn. So those were um, significant, but also, and watch in the center of that diagram, a star appears. So there's a guest star appearing in March of 5 BC, and it may have been a recurrent nova, but the, there's someone here in Tucson who doesn't think uh, yeah, it, it, they would have seen it and it was too faint. So maybe it was, maybe it wasn't. It's not in the Chinese records that kept up great records, nor is any comet. And, you know, in constellation Capricorn would be where there'd be. So, yeah. Uh, but anyway, we, 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 we dismiss comets, don't, didn't we? Because they're a, a, a bad, a bad omen. But are they? Comets have been spin doctored. Mm, we know all about spin doctoring, don't we? Um, comets have been spin doctored. And this is uh, a coin uh, struck by, uh, you know, Augustus, the Emperor Augustus, uh, basically in honor of divine Julius, who's Julius? That's his predecessor, Julius Caesar, remember, was murdered and so died prematurely. And just soon after um, the death of Julius Caesar, there was a wonderful, um, you know, great games being held in honor of um, 
Caesar, uh, the victorious uh, Caesar. And what appeared was a comet, a comet in 44 be, uh, before Christ BC. And so the Spindle got, this, got get together saying, oh no, a, a comet is a wonderful sign. It's a wonderful sign that uh, Julius Caesar is a god, and this is Divus, you know, divine Julius there, and you can see the comet, you see its tail and the great fiery business there on the right hand, uh, you know, the reverse side of the coin. So that's fine. Yeah. So comets can be good signs, can't they? Hmm. In that case, we should ask whether we had a star-like comet. Remember it said it sounded like a single object. Can there be star-like comets? We all know the comets with tails, such as that one, um, you know, divine Julius Caesar in 44 BC. Uh, but um, yeah, maybe the ones that don't have tails, uh, but are, you know, fuzzy objects in the sky short answer is yes there are and the Chinese distinguish them between the ones with tails and uh, the ones with uh, uh, which didn't have tails were fuzzy and came and went now I'm on the when I show you the next bit of video it's going to go very fast forget all the stars in the pictures around look at the object in the center which is one of these um, comets that suddenly bursts into into activity okay ready Look at the set, look at that center object. Okay. And hopefully this is now a succession of pictures. There. Eh, it's not. <laughs> um, well, that's, uh, uh, this is a movie and it's out there, you, which you'll find, of a comet uh, that suddenly burst into activity. And actually, no surprise, because this uh, it's called 29P, P for periodic. Um, we see it occurring not just once, it recurs actually, uh, it happily goes between um, Jupiter and Saturn. And so we can see it a lot of time in the sky. And indeed, why I pick it up is because it had an outburst just last November, um, a beautiful outburst uh, on November the 2nd, where it really flared up. Now, if you have a telescope, it'll flare up, you won't be able to see it with your eye. It's a bit... Uh, it's a bit faint, as you can see from this picture here. Um, but uh, an interesting, on your um, Monday, so I think it'd be your Monday evening, uh, again with a telescope, this comet is going to pass in front. It moves. It's going to pass in front of a background star, and one will be able to see um, as the light fades and brightens, fades and bite brightens, you'll be able to see, um, uh, you know, if you record these things on a chart recorder or something, um, so make a graph of it, uh, how the various rings come out from this comet, each ring corresponding to an outburst. So that's why it's, as it were, um, my comet uh, for, for this Christmas time. So. 29P outburst, this is an outburst in 2018, um, August, shown in infrared light by the Spitzer telescope, which was up in space. Um, <laughs> but comets, um, David Levy said, uh, you know, comets are like cats, they're quite unpredictable and they're have tails. Well, some of them have tails, like some cats have tails, and there's the Manx cat that doesn't have a tail. They're beautiful, but they're unpredictable. And would they foretell a birth? Well, that's over to you. So, okay, I suppose we're all uh, um, wise people wise men or kings. Um, we're not quite sure. We're the kings, not wise men. Okay, no one trusts experts anymore. You'll have to be your own expert of deciding um, what the star is going to be. So the, the true star, your choice. Is it a natural phenomena? You know, one of the things we've just been considering in this way uh, that supports uh, the, the Bible account. You know, uh, Matthew there says really is something there. Uh, you know, funnily enough, is, is it a miracle? And I suppose this would be a miracle. 
if that's what the, the wise men saw. Are you sure we're going the right way? You're kidding, right? Look, the arrow points right over the, the cave or where to, I, the house in Bethlehem where the Christ child is. Um, a miracle, okay, maybe a miracle. Or a literary symbol, you know, um, because Jesus is the light. And so to have a light in the sky showing the, you know, the light of God come to us in the flesh that we can see. Ah, oh, God is light. And he can be found also by those who seek him with a sincere heart. An image of this seeking can be seen in the Magi who were led to Bethlehem by the star. For them, God's light appears a journey to be undertaken, a star which led them on a path of discovery. The star is a sign of God's patience with our eyes, which need to grow accustomed to his brightness. Hmm. That's actually Pope Francis in uh, 2013, in writing in the uh, encyclical, or his letter, Lumen Fidei. So, yeah, the popes have been uh, keen on this uh, star. Out of the silence, music, out of the darkness, light, out of uncertainty, promise. Hope was born that night. Our choice in our star has got to be the star that will help us find Jesus, who is the light for all peoples and all ages. And so maybe we should, yes, go out at night time and look at the heavens and take notice of all the things which lead us to God, including science and history as well. And the astronomers among you will recognize this uh, formation called the Christmas star and the angel. Don't you see the angel with the wonderful wings flying towards the star? If these wise men led by the star to search for the king of the Jews represent the movement of the Gentiles, that's us, towards Christ, this implies that the cosmos speaks of Christ, even though its language is not yet fully intelligible to us in our present state. It's not the star that determines the child's destiny. It's the child that directs the star. Again, Pope Benedict the Sixteenth. So, in a sense, it's a reverse of astrology. The heavens don't dictate our destiny. It's the, or the, the one who's the newborn's destiny. It's the newborn present in the heavens. The reverse of astrology. Okay. Well, like I say, it's a happy Christmas. Say Merry Christmas in the USA, where I am now in, in Tucson, whatever it works. And uh, I'll just say, it, there is an account of this star, um, I think by Guy Consomagno on our Vatican Observatory website. So all one word, vaticanobservatory.org, and you'll find it somewhere among the, the blogs and things there. So explore. Thank you. Thank you, Father. That was very enlightening and very inspiring, Father. Oh, I'm so glad. Um, any reactions? We are allowed to have any reactions. Thank you, Father. Yeah. I have the same. I have the same uh, impression. I start. It started with the, the with the with the scientific astronomical exposition, and then very beautifully. Father also mentioned the theological aspect of uh, the star of Bethlehem. It's really very enlightening and informative as well. Well, uh, Father, I, I, I don't know about the other panelists. Uh, do you have any comments? 
before we well, go into the Q and A. Yeah. Yeah, Father, I uh, just want to say that uh, your message is perfect for the Christmas season. And uh, what you said is for us individually to find our own star of Bethlehem to guide our lives on this earth. So thank you for enlightening us. Edwin, you've again put it perfectly. We each need to find our own star. And we can maybe write a book about it. <laughs> it's a book about our life. It's finding our star like these uh, wise men. It took them a journey. And then they went back by the way, as we know. And as you said, Father, it really depends on our own interpretation of what the star of Bethlehem means for us personally. So it could be uh, viewed as a, uh, a scientific fact or mm -hmm. uh, 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 literary uh, symbolism, or just uh, a, a very inspirational message for all of us. Or a miracle. Or a miracle. Or a miracle. Or a miracle. Yeah. Yes. The Chinese didn't record. <laughs> so thank you, Father. Get it. Yeah, uh, Father, thank you. Uh, I, we have some questions here, and oh. uh, I, yeah, I remember you were discussing the how they were able to sort of uh, have an idea where at the time where when uh, Jesus uh, uh, was born, and one of the question here is uh, uh, how was December twenty five determined to be the date of Jesus Christ's birth? Yeah. So I guess it has something to do with the calendar, how it, how it came to be. Yeah. No, um, th this is a uh, uh, this is a wonderful question. Yes, because uh, as you say, December twenty fifth is it's a fixed date, isn't it? And uh, a lot of things aren't fixed at the moment. Easter, they say, is not is not fixed. It's approximately in the springtime, but uh, etc. Um, but so it's a fixed date. How is that? Well, it's fixed by good traditions that uh, were before the, the birth of Jesus and Northern Hemisphere. So in the Southern Hemisphere, it's different. Uh, but the sun in the Northern Hemisphere stands still. It stops its journey to the South and away, as it were, away from us in the North. Uh, on December the 21st, so that's called the solstice, and then starts to come back and things get warmer and, you know, we know there's going to be an end to winter. So it's, uh, and the returning of the sun, the returning of light. So Christmas, you know, the coming uh, of the light of God uh, was, you know, fixed in relation to that uh, solstice, the winter solstice in the Northern Hemisphere. Now it so happens that my mother was born in South Africa, so she was born on December the 21st in South Africa, and it was the longest day, it was the height of summer, so she always had a kind of another way of looking at it there. But anyway, from our Northern perspective, that's it. When might it have been? It could have been springtime. You know, when would the shepherds have been out with their flocks, you know, overnight when it was uh, in, you know, near um, Bethlehem, it was, uh, you know, warm enough for them to be out then. So it could have been. And hence, you'll see in those dates, those configurations, that it's not, you know, the kind of the the birth or the 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 rising, the, the acronym rising has not necessarily been, you know, December, certainly not December the 25th. In other times, the, the various scholars were happy to put the birth at other times of the year. But yes, you know, for us, and certainly, you know, Southern Hemisphere, okay, apologies for that, but you do have a lovely bright sun then, so the, the light, but for the normal thing, Hemisphere kind of makes sense of the uh, return of the light. Yeah. Thank you, Father. Uh, 
Here's another question uh, from, from about the, um, this time about the geography. The Bible says the star was in the east, but wasn't the land of Israel to the west of Babylonian astrologers. Well, yeah, so it, it, exactly. And so star in the east. So that's in the um, traditional, uh, you know, King James version of the Bible translates that the star being in the east. But you will have noticed that I also put in parallel on the right hand side that other the uh, you know revised new revised version uh, translation which was the star at its rising you know again it's that sort of uh, rising obviously things rise they saw it at its rising not saw it in the east uh, it, well you know th that's the time that they noticed the phenomena so i i don't think it said that they had to be to the west of uh, bethlehem mm -hmm. Depends Thank on, you, you know, how you yeah. translate that. That's why I say it's good, good to look at various versions of the Bible <laughs> and see what it says there. <laughs> but no, it's, it's a good question. But, you know, Babylon, it, you know, to the east of um, Judea was uh, very much a center of astrology, astrological learning. And uh, we get a lot of, and we get obviously a lot of our astronomy, so the science from their accurate, you know, as accurate as they could, observing the positions of planets and things in the heavens. So it's a kind of astronomy started to be built on the astrology, which was so good at the positions of the various things. So anyway, a, a lovely site of learning about uh, a knowledge about the the heavens in the east in Babylon area, east of Jerusalem, Judea. Yeah, good question though. <laughs> you know, ch check the uh, check the versions. It's, it's the version, a bit yeah. instructive. Yeah. Thank you, Father. Uh, uh, this uh, other question here is related to uh, the discussions before about the various conjunctions, planetary conjunctions, and uh, he was mentioning whether. Uh, one can use a planetarium software to actually try to visualize the star, the sky over Bethlehem during the birth of Jesus. Yeah. What, what was that the one that was actually used uh, uh, in the in the discussions in the some of the books that were mentioned and even in your discussion, Father? Yeah, but of course, yes. So we have, we have wonderful uh, um, starry sky and uh, uh, various things. Uh, two various things we can run on our computers, even on our um, smartphones that can tell us the position of things in the sky. So yes, these uh, scholars would certainly have run things back to that, that time. And obviously quite a period of years. So if they're going from about eight BC, let's say to four, or even um, to, to one BC, there's quite a period of time to run the sky through and see what, what what's happening. Yeah. So. You can you can enjoy doing it when you've got uh, <laughs> a little bit of time has to do <laughs> run it through remembering of course that our calendar took a jump in the uh, uh, late 16th century uh, with the change from the julian which is julius caesar calendar to the now the pope gregory the 13th calendar um, so that the, the day is kind of some days are missing, so your um, sky program has got to take that into account. But anyway, it it will give the a, a rough date to within so many days. Yeah, great thing to do. What was the ancient sky like? Uh, yeah. So, Father, thank you for that. Now is uh, I might ask the panelists again whether you have other questions. Yeah. Uh, we do, yeah. we do again. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Oh, <laughs> oh dear, uh, the experts. <laughs> <laughs> Father, um, now the star of Bethlehem uh, signified the birth of Jesus, and if I remember correctly, uh, there was also a celestial phenomenon that occurred when uh, Jesus died on the cross during crucifixion, a solar eclipse. And so 
what do you think would be the um the a celestial sign that would signify his second coming this is a short answer that jesus told us don't try and guess get on with life <laughs> it'll be clear <laughs> that's what jesus said so yeah it's a lovely question it's a, we can always conjecture about it but basically we don't know but what jesus said it'll be obvious yeah because his birth his death showed the celestial uh sign and you know maybe uh his second return because rather in the book of revelations um yeah. in the book sealed with seven seals i remember uh you know when it says there and and uh the, the when the seal was broken um the moon turned red and the sun black and so for an ordinary person or if you're you know for an astronomer or an amateur astronomer you think okay how can that be when the sun I mean, the moon turns red is a lunar eclipse, and the sun turns black is a solar eclipse. So how can both happen at the same time? And uh, as as uh, somebody who loves to read, I thought, hey, this could be an impact uh, event because when you have an impact event, um, which you know, sixty five million years ago we had a mass extinction event. Uh, from an asteroid impact and so earth material got thrown into space and turned the sun black the and the moon uh, I mean into the atmosphere and turned the moon red and the sun black because of the dust because of the dust particle in the upper atmosphere mm. yeah yeah uh it's always good to use our science as you are doing to, to kind of speculate uh, on these things and um, phenomena and try and kind of link them up. Yeah. Um, but remember, the book of Revelation is not about uh, so future. much about you know, the future time. It's about the encouragement of the Christians in Rome under persecution to persist in their faith. So that's wow. what these visions are about, They're not a, a kind of a map of the future of what's going to happen. It's a current encouragement in the um, in the kind of, uh, you know, the kind of stories, the mythology, in the, the imaginations of the time of, you know, when everything comes right. You know, and basically the Christians are, are be in Rome under persecutions, be encouraged by, you know, St. John uh, to persist in their faith because things are going to come right. So it's not designed as a, a map of the future. Again, we don't, as you well know, both of you well know, we don't look to the Bible for science. So we don't take the first chapter of Genesis as an account of the um the making of the universe and our world and you know we don't take certainly don't take the days literally as 24 hours and the rest of it, it, it there's what we do look is for the message behind that what god is telling us and obviously in the bit, first chapter of genesis what we're being told by the, the spirit the holy spirit inspiring the writer who uses the story myths of the time, as we well know, uses those stories um, to embody a point about God and creation. God made, you know, and God said. So, you know, our universe is, is not an accident. It's a result of, of God. And um, God sets up a relationship with creation both the material things and with hum with life, you know, with all life and with human life, God sets up a relationship. And that's what um, you know, Genesis, the uh, first chapter, and the second, which is another account of creation, again, using different stories. 
about it. It's about the relationship of God to what God created. And so the same thing with Revelation. It's a wonderful thing. It's an encouragement, but not a, you know, a vision of the, you know, the our actual physical future. Okay. I think but, you, uh, you, Father, one more. So yeah, cool. if that's the case, uh and in the in the book of Revelations, all that happened, I mean the story, and then was the second coming of Jesus. Does that mean uh Jesus came a second time already, or there won't be a second coming? No. Um, again, I, maybe the best thing is to go back to the gospel and how you know, we have the record of uh, Jesus is saying, y yes, Jesus does say uh, that Jesus will, that he will come again, but he doesn't spell out how. Ah. So it, it's clear. And we've had various readings recently. And, and one of them was on a Sunday, wasn't it? Um, you know, uh, Jesus speaking about be watchful, be ready. That's right. It's kind of our uh, Advent preparation for Christmas reading. So forget which Sunday it was, maybe the second Sunday or was it the first uh, Sunday in, in Advent. Uh, and Jesus saying, you know, be prepared, um, watch, you know, be ready. You know, it'll come like a thief in the night. You know, Jesus even comparing himself or God to a thief, which is an amazing idea. <laughs> but it's that idea. When you don't expect it, if you did expect the thief coming, you'd be watching and waiting. And Jesus said, watch and wait and be prepared. And then that, I, uh, what always puzzled me in back uh, was, um, till recently, was Jesus saying, you know, and there'll be, um, you know, two people, you know, working out in the fields, one will be left and the other taken. There'll be two people at home and in bed. One will be left and the other taken. What's going on there? And I, it's kind of suggested to me that maybe that the one left, one take, a kind of our false self will be left. Our true self will be taken. And it's oh. that, that genuine self, that self that's in relation to each other and to God, that's the one that will be taken, um, you know, at the end times. And what we know, it's that that will be taken at our own death. That's that's the, that's our, for sure, our second coming for each of us. Yeah. So the second coming is not actually a, a coming, but for each person. Well, uh, yes. And also, no, it's both a coming for each person. And it seems to be some kind of second, a universal second coming mm. it seems to be certainly that it, in, in in the scripture as you say particularly in the gospel and certainly then reflected um obviously uh the apostle uh, saint paul uh was much uh, thinking about that say his early writings to the thessalonians and they were so well okay if uh Christ's about to come again. Well, why bother to do anything? We should just sit around and wait. Don't let's work, whatever. And Paul says, for heaven's sake, literally, and <laughs> say, get on and work and go about things as usual. And, uh, you know, Christ will come when Christ comes. You get on with the, your daily thing, um, just as Paul worked. So, yes, the answer is two yeses. Yes, our own personal second coming is at our death. The second coming for the, you know, the cosmos. Well, we wait and see. And obviously, the science says various things about that, and people have been trying to reconcile the, uh, uh, the cosmic end, whatever it might be, with the gospel. Again, I think it's very much as in the beginning in Genesis. If we try and ma map science out through looking at the first chapter in Genesis, it doesn't work. Just as if we try and work out, map out the ending of the cosmos in revelation it doesn't work either because mm. it's not it's not meant to be a scientific treatise but it is meant to tell us about the relationship of ourselves and creation to god through jesus in the spirit yeah thank you father uh can i just read one question here from one of our attendees uh, Resti Santiago. 
And the question here is, can you please expound on the concept of reverse astrology, Father? Thank you. The concept uh, of reverse astrology. Reverse astrology. Uh, first time I've reverse. heard of it. Reverse yeah, astrology. Okay. Yeah, oh, yeah the, 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 the final slide. Yeah, um, I know what you mean. Yeah, that was, uh, you know, borrowing from uh, Pope Benedict. Um, astrology, of course, is the belief um, that, the, you know, the heavens, the movement, uh, the heavens influence what happens on earth. And so when we are born, we are, we are influenced, you know, the pattern of what's going to happen to us is there in the heavens, in the positions, it's kind of foretold in the positions of the planets and the moon and the sun, um, you know, in the relation to the constellations of the stars, you know, at our birth, that's then going to dictate what our lives are going to be like. And what Pope Benedict was saying, no, actually, it's not that, in a sense, you know, certainly in the case, if there is a physical phenomena that corresponds with the Bethlehem star, then it's actually, it works exactly the other way. It's the, the newborn that dictates what happens in the heavens rather than the heavens dictating what happens to the newborn. So that's the reverse. So. Uh, that's as you can see, and for ourselves, in a sense, no, you know, the heavens are so vast that we don't dictate what goes on, and yet we do, because we do influence. We we know we're influencing our planet, um, and there's a, a real crisis in our environment and the increase in the warming of our planet, which it's really hard to get away from the fact that it, this is human caused. There's a strong human factor behind the warming of our planet. And um, what I, with a colleague, are uh, looking into it, uh, the both of us, is, yeah, the environmental uh, or ecological concerns that um, when we explore the moon and our solar system, that's going to be essential uh, for that exploration. We've got to do it with the uh, ecological, you know, um, uh, you know, correctness. Otherwise, we're not going to survive. So it's a matter of survival, you know, and uh, on other, on the moon and other planets um, to, to be tidy, to be, you know, to, to, to be conserve things, to reuse, to do things well. So it's a matter of survival as it is on our earth. Now, it's a matter of human survival to uh, try and reduce the amount of uh, warming of the earth. Okay, I, I suddenly get off on another way, you know, <laughs> the connections of heaven and earth, but there, there really are, you know, so that's how we can influence. We are influencing our earth at the moment. Yeah. Thank you, Father. That's a very great explanation. Uh, there's another, this is kind of off topic, but in relation to a space exploration, uh, is there a church, or what is the church's view regarding SETI, SETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. Uh, uh, the church, uh, like a good scientist, is waiting for data. <laughs> and I think, I, I think, I think that, that's you know obviously you know, data that's irrefutable uh, at the moment. And so the church basically, though you may. Find it. The church says, the church believes in, you know, uh, ET. Um, the short answer is no, the church has never officially pronounced on that. There are people within the church have, and certainly a former director of the Vatican Observatory, dear um, Father Dr. Jose Funes, uh, has expressed his, you know, belief in uh, that there are indeed uh, life beyond, intelligent life beyond our, our Earth, and, and that's fine. But he doesn't express this as the church, but as Father Jose Funes, just as, you know, if, if I would say anything about that. I think I'm rather more cautious. Well, I, I suspect I, myself and Father Jose are very close. I'd say, yes, uh, at the moment, there doesn't seem to be any reason why there should not be life, intelligent life elsewhere. 
and say, but we have not yet encountered it. Thank you, Father. Uh, maybe one last question uh, from our panelists. Uh, Peter, I, I believe you have a question. Yeah, hi, Father. Uh, hi. First of all, uh, thank you for the wonderful lecture. It was very interesting and uh, it was really full of information. Um, yeah, this just popped up in my mind. Uh, so could precession play a role that may have shown the positions of the stars differently in the sky during the time when Jesus was about to be born? Oh yeah, okay, lovely. So um, you, you bring up the idea of precession, is that right? Yes, yes, Father. So that is, um, well, uh, and all kinds of things too. The skies are not static. You know, yes, you know, for us, as we look at it, uh, you're quite right. You know, the things that move and change are the planets uh, and the moon and our sun. And these are the changing things, you know, we can see in our lifetime. But looking over, you know, the thousands of years, then yes, things do change. One of the things clearly that happens is that our Earth being a spinning top, you know, if you imagine it as a spinning top, then the axis uh, of that spin, so where that points to in the skies, in, in the heavens, changes. It sort of, it, it goes in a little circle around. So our dear um, in the Northern Hemisphere, pole star up in the North, the North Pole, wasn't, you know, the pole star, you know, th uh, thousands of years ago, it was shifted. It was, it was somewhere else in the northerly direction, but uh, the axis of our Earth spin mo moved a little bit um, uh, and sort of moves around like that. Uh, so, yeah, um, the, the it, that's just the phenomena. Also, stars move. And so the constellation, you know, thousands, you know, certainly millions of years ago, tens of thousands, hundred thousands of years ago, would be different because stars, have, you know, move in relation to each other a bit. So, uh, yeah, the, the heavens are there. There's lots of things going on in the heavens. You're right. So precession is something to look up for those interested in astronomy. Yeah. Thank you, Father. But for the, for the moment, we have the pole star, <laughs> and that's yes. amazing. As those in the north, in the southern hemisphere, uh, sorry, you don't have a star at the pole, but you can kind of work it out uh, where it, it probably, where it is. Thank you, thank you Father. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That was our last question, Father, and thank you so much again for uh, for for joining us at, at such a an early hour, 5 a.m. there, <laughs> and giving the lecture and patiently answering all our questions. So uh, allow us to present you, Father, with uh, our ALP uh, Certificate of Appreciation. Uh, let me read it. Uh, the Certificate of Appreciation from the Astronomical League of the Philippines is presented to Father Chris Corbali, SJ, for his invaluable insights, experiences, and expertise shared with the participants of the webinar entitled, What Was the Star of Bethlehem? Held as part of the ALP Astronomy Experts Speaker Series of 2022, given the 17th day of December, 2022, signed by President James Kevin T. and uh, Vice President, uh, yours, yours truly, Jose Francisco Aguilar. Thank you so much, Father. And uh, yeah. Thank you so much for inviting me, you know, ALP and all you behind <laughs> Uh, it's it's been a delight to uh, talk with you about what you gather is a, a, a favorite, uh, you know, idea, of, you know, consideration of mine, the Christmas star and the themes. Yeah. So thank you very much and for the good questions, all who are listening and the good questions. Thank you again for the, the enlightenment, Father. <laughs> Okay. Father, this just, will uh, make us yeah, think yeah. the whole day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be thinking about this the whole it's day. A, it's a great uh, time to reflect uh, during the season about what you told us, Father. <laughs> Everything that's happening now. Uh, can we have a picture, a group yeah. picture, uh, before we proceed uh, with Father, Peter? Yeah. 
Yep, sure. Eric, Eric, can you turn on your video? Uh, yes, oh. he has it on. Um, on his other camera. Okay. Yeah, I, I have it on. All right. Oh, yeah, Eric. Okay, uh, good. Good, sorry. I was looking at the other box. Yeah, the other, so <laughs> the other session. <laughs> yes. Okay, okay, everybody. One, two, three, smile. All right, one more. <laughs> okay. Say cheese, three, two, one, cheese. Thank you. All right. And and Jet, Edwin wanted to say something too. Okay. Oh, you said you wanted to say. Something. Oh, uh, yeah. I just want to say uh, uh, from Imelda and I, and from all of uh, the ALP members, uh, we wish uh, you a very Merry Christmas. Happy Christmas. Happy Father Christmas. Christmas. Happy Christmas. <laughs> and a uh, a blessed New Year. Thank you so much for sharing your your time with us and. Uh, uh, your lecture was uh, wonderful and very enlightening. And as you know, Father, uh, the Philippines is uh, has a very large uh, population of uh, Roman Catholics. It, it's the I think the largest in Southeast Asia. Yeah. So thank you for your uh, lecture and for sharing your time with us today. And Jeff, can we have Father uh, join us uh, for Jay's? Uh... Okay, so I would like to share my slide again for the next part. Yeah. Uh, yes. Can you lead a little prayer, Father? For uh, Well, Jay Pasakoff was our very first speaker for this uh, webinar series. Uh, astronomy expert speaker series, and he's such a good friend, a wonderful person. And up to the end, he was he was working, and I I didn't get the clue as to the last days of his life when we were talking back in October, when um, he he insisted that I visit. We were supposed to visit a common friend, and um, I didn't get the clue that he wasn't doing very well when he um, actually uh, insisted that we visit that friend. Uh, even without him. Um, he has been an inspiration to many, has been a good, uh, a good you know, educator to many, um, and a very wonderful eclipse chaser and professor. And we will miss him. So if you could say a little prayer, Father, that would really be very appreciated. nice and appreciated. Almighty, so let's take a moment and pray. Almighty God, creator of the universe, which so delighted Jay Pasigoff that he wanted to share that delight with others, and particularly the amazing phenomena of the eclipses, the total eclipses, when we seem to be in a world of magic, a world somehow that's closer to you and the, the, the spiritual. So we thank you for his life, for his enthusiasm, and for all the gifts that, that you gave him and gave us through his work. And we ask you then to bless him now forever in, in, with you in heaven and to bless to Naomi, his wife, uh, give her consolation and the whole family and all those who miss uh, Jay, praying that we may carry on his inspiration, love of the heavens, and joy in spreading that knowledge. This we ask through the one who was born in Bethlehem, Christ the Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank, Thank you, Father. Father. Yeah. It was such a privilege for us to have met uh, Jay, uh, for us who met him just during the, being as our first webinar speaker, but it, he, I will really, truly really remember him. Thank you, Jay, for everything. Thank you, Father. Yeah, yeah uh, we, we remember Jay very well yeah. at, uh, yeah. at the Vatican Observatory, you know, his visits to our headquarters. And last time I saw him was, um, but well, one in uh, Vienna for a meeting there, and then he and Naomi came for a, a, a meeting in Rome 
immediately after, so saw them there. So again, the same enthusiasm, this time about a, a Jesuit who has uh, started astrophysics. That's our understanding, our physical understanding of the universe, and Jay was very much involved with that. So, yeah. Over Thank to you, you Jose. <laughs> I could say a lot about Jay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Dada, Imelda? Yeah, me? Uh, oh, yeah, I, I am good, just, like, yeah. you know, I, I am very fascinated with what I heard from Father this morning that I think uh, throughout Christmas, I'll be thinking about this. Thank you. Thank you, Father. Well, uh, before we conclude today's webinar, uh, you can see here Jay as our first speaker. We had 10, Father is the 10th speaker. Uh, and we would like to, of course, express our uh, deep gratitude for all of our speakers. And uh, But before that, uh, uh, I would like to inform the attendees that we will be sending our certificate of attendance uh, by email uh, who were able to join us uh, today. And, uh, and uh, I would like to thank this opportunity again, again, of course, to thank all our previous speakers. And we will be continuing our Astronomy Expert Speaker Series uh, next year. Uh, it, was, uh, it was very successful and we are so grateful uh, for all those who share their knowledge with us and we can never thank them enough. And uh, you can actually view our, our, all our past webinars, including Father's webinar now. Uh, we will be posting them in our ALP YouTube, official YouTube channel uh, uh, for you to view at your own leisure later on. And lastly, uh, we would like to announce our next webinar. Uh, Father mentioned uh, David Levy, uh, who will be our next speaker on January 14, 2023. That is a Saturday here in the Philippines, 12 o'clock noon. And uh, January 13 uh, in the United States uh, at 11 p.m. So uh, actually, yeah, next year, uh, 2023 marks the 30th anniversary of the discovery of the comet Shoemaker-Levy 9. The comet was discovered by the team of Jean and Carolyn Shoemaker and David Levy on March 20. 1993 using uh, the Mount Palomar at Mount Palomar Observatory near San Diego, California. And fragments of uh, Schumacher Levy 9 later on crashed into Jupiter during the summer of 1994, producing some of the largest impacts ever observed in our solar system. It was truly an unforgettable astronomical event. And David will talk about how they discovered the comet and the danger of such objects colliding with Earth in the near future. We will be posting the registration link for this free webinar at the webpage of the Astronomical League of the Philippines. This is a free webinar, just like all our previous webinars. So please register once we post the link at our webpage and at our Facebook page. And so thank you again. And uh, Father greeted us already, but uh, we would like to wish everyone a very merry and blessed Christmas. Thank you. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Yeah. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, Father. And to our, uh, to our, our uh, attendees as well. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. So Thank for you, the panelists, uh, we will be having, I will post a link for our post-webinar meeting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thank Father. You, Happy, Happy Christmas. Christmas. Happy Happy Christmas. Christmas. Were, you, were you here, June, during June. our picture taking? Yes. Oh, you <laughs> he was here. Father, did you hear Edwin? <laughs> He said, Happy Christmas, Merry New Year. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it's Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, but whichever way. <laughs> Lovely. Um, just uh, you know, a word about uh, David Vivi. You, you may know that his wife, Wendy, died recently. Yes. So, yes. Yeah, he, uh, so to remember. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's very unfortunate. And, uh, you know, David loved her so much for uh, I believe 30 years and so um, we spoke to him yesterday and uh, he is he's doing, doing well yeah, he's yeah. doing well considering what happened but you know uh, I'm pretty sure this time of year is going to be hard for oh, him because uh, he, it will be the first Christmas without you know uh, his wife so so we'll try to keep uh, 
uh, calling him once in a while just to cheer yeah. him up uh, and uh, check on him. Yeah. And it's great that you have him talking next in January. So that's something yeah. that he So we, we thought we'd like to keep him busy and engaged. Uh, uh, and, you know, for 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 uh, this event, Father, I, I think this is the first time humanity actually, back then, it's the first time for humanity to actually observe an a impact, impact. Uh, of a comet to a planet. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, we are so fortunate uh, for David to be speaking about this discovery 30 years later with us. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I hope and I ask him if he can show the discovery plate that they recently recovered. And I said, maybe you can show it during your talk. Um, oh. Yeah. And and that would be really cool. Historic. I mean, yeah. Talking, uh, I mean, talking about this event, uh, I mean, David, the discoverer, being the one, because he's the only one uh, amongst the three of them. He's still who's, living. He's still oh. living. Yeah. yeah. And he is a, a wonderful comet hunter, uh, having discovered and he's many a wonderful comets. Speaker. He's a wonderful yeah. speaker. He's a wonderful <laughs> speaker. <laughs> Uh, yeah, twenty three discoveries. I think I'll, right. I'll I'll look at the recording that you have afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> no, father, it will be early there because oh, really? uh, it's gonna be actually it's gonna be. Uh, oh yeah, uh, you're yeah. the same time as same same time zone as he is, so it's about eight thirty. Uh, oh well, nine o'clock at night actually. Yeah, so it's gonna okay. be at night. Nine o'clock yeah. at night. It's still okay. early for you, but for us, it's going to be 11 o'clock at night. It's in the morning. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. But we're all astronomers, Mother. So. so we can stay yeah, up late. In the morning. We're up at night and sleep in the morning. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> we, will, we will send you the invitation, Father, and there'll be there in case you will yes. be able to yeah. watch it. Yeah. 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 I, I'll at least ca yeah, oh. catch it. Yeah. Yeah. So again, uh, thank, thank you everyone. Thank Merry you. Christmas. Thank you, <laughs> thank you and Merry Christmas you, to all. Thank Thanks, you. Christmas, everyone. As I say, you know, yeah. my having to reset up everything. I just last night I thought, let me just make sure on the other computer that it's loaded. And <laughs> <laughs> well, you're right, Father. It was a lot of we, forces that evil, were going on. Even our background, we were disappearing a lot. So we had yeah. to repeat the background. Sorry. I, I said you, you mentioned there were a lot of uh, bad forces that was working oh, yeah. against, yeah. against <laughs> no, it always tries to destroy it. Yeah. Yeah, technical I, I, I'm issues. Sure of that. Yeah, and, yeah, and our background was we were dis disappearing from our background. So well, well yeah, that, that's a little bit of movement and things. Yes, you were yeah. 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 But but fine, it worked. <laughs> to the minute <laughs> <laughs> we were not late that's the okay. uh, we will let you go father already because uh, i think you have to uh you've been taking too much of your time already <laughs> okay, well, but great to meet you all keep up the good work Definitely. thank you father thank you thank you very much father thank you very much thank you very much bye 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 See you guys bye. everyone bye bye yes. thank you bye bye, bye everybody bye everybody so i attend this thank you Right. Bye. So we'll have our post up there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. later. Yeah. Okay. Uh, See you later. Yeah. Bye. See you later, guys. Bye. Bye. See you later.